So uh, thank you for inviting us. And uh, you know, for us, the Magma community is a new one. So we're excited to be here and get to know it better. The project I'm gonna talk about is a research project that the group of us at UC Berkeley working in collaboration with Shadi Hassan, who's from Facebook. And just a very quick, and also I should mention, Ji Hong is the PhD student leading the work. And he's also gonna chime in towards later in this talk. So just a quick outline, what I'm gonna cover, you know, this is gonna be pretty high level and quick since we have uh, 15 minutes. Just tell you a little bit about why we're trying to change or develop a new cellular architecture, then talk a little bit about the overall approach we're taking with um, this architecture, we call it cell bricks, and you'll see why in a little bit. And then Ji Hong's gonna take over and talk a little bit about uh, the prototype we've been building on top of Magma. And so with that, you know, what are we trying to do or what's the motivation for uh, this research project? Quite simply, we're trying to grow the tent in cellular. I think, you know, we all know that a market in which you have a lot of competition is a good one. It's good for consumers. It's good for innovation, good for the technology. We also know that the cellular ecosystem is perhaps not the best example of a market with lots of competing providers. In fact, in the US, the top three providers have over 98% of the user subscribers. And so quite simply what we want to do is try and enable an ecosystem in which you can have lots of competing um, cellular providers, so infrastructure operators. And our goal is so, to enable this is to lower the barrier to entry for new entrants. We want new cellular infrastructure providers to be able to enter the market more easily and to compete more easily with large or small other infrastructure providers. And so the, the key, we, if, we want to, if we say we want to lower the barrier to entry, we think the first step or the most important piece that we have to enable is to make sure that a cellular infrastructure provider with a small to a mid-sized footprint can play. So what we mean by this could be, for example, a city government or regional business or an enterprise or a university campus could set up you know, even just one cell tower or maybe 10 or 100 and be a viable, um, cellular infrastructure providers. So they should be able to participate as equal citizens within the cellular ecosystem. And in just focusing on the technical questions, there are lots of ecosystem questions, but even just looking at the technical architecture of the cellular infrastructure, we think this is actually hard to achieve with today's architecture. And at the highest level, the reason for this is that the architecture we have today relies very heavily on these pre-established trust relationships or contracts and in-network coordination. And these mechanisms are pretty heavyweight as a technical foundation. So just to make this more concrete, you know, the three biggest examples probably of where we build on trust or in-network coordination are first, very simply, when you have a user or a UE, when you attach or you connect to the cellular infrastructure, you attach to a MNO or network that you have a trusted relationship with. So you connect to a network with which you have a contract saying that they are your provider. So everything we build on top like authentication and accounting is built on the assumption of trust between the user and the infrastructure provider. Likewise, when you have handovers, when you have a user that's moving between cell towers within an MNO the fact that the user is enjoying seamless mobility, that their TCP connections stay open, that their applications are seamless as they're moving between towers is because within the network, these towers are coordinating to make sure that that handover is seamless. So again, we're relying on in-network coordination. And of course, when you're roaming, when you're accessing some other provider's network, not your home provider, the only reason you can do that is because that roaming, the provider's network that you're roaming in has set up an agreement or built trust with your home operator. You cannot just walk up to a random infrastructure provider and use their, their infrastructure. And these reasons, um, when we start to think about shifting an ecos the, the cellular ecosystem to one where you have lots of providers, potentially small scale providers like a mall or an enterprise campus, this assumption that you're gonna pre-establish trust doesn't scale. So for example, if I just took the previous picture and now said, okay, I have lots of smaller providers. The assumption, if you want broad coverage, you're going to say that the user signs up with an MNO. 
But now if we want broad coverage, we're going to say that MNO has to have these contractual legal agreements with a whole number of other MNOs. And that simply doesn't scale. Asking a new entrant to sign a thousand contracts with other providers is a very high barrier to entry. Likewise, if we think of seamless mobility and we say we have a large number of infrastructure providers, that you, then what that means is that as a user is mobile, we're quite frequently switching between not just towers, but between administrative entities and administrative providers. And here again, having these providers coordinate to do seamless handovers would be overly heavy, heavyweight because again, it requires these pre-established agreements between operators. And you know, one might ask, what, what if you have an MVNO architecture, something like Google Fi, does that change the game? Does it make it simpler to have lots of large, smaller scale providers? And the answer is not really, because all that having an MVNO in the picture changes in today's world is the user signs up with the MVNO, but we'd still be asking the MVNO to go out and set up established trust agreements with a large number of other providers. And again, that doesn't scale. And so Google Fi, for example, today has two or three of these trust agreements in place, not thousands. And so given that context and given where we wanted to go, which was to enable lots of competing providers, the goal we have in Cellbricks is that we want to allow a user to consume cellular access on demand from any available infrastructure operator. And any meaning it can be a small provider or a large provider, it can be a trusted operator or even an untrusted operator. So it's really a user should be able to walk up to any area, whatever infrastructure is available, they should be able to use it. But importantly, we want to enable that without requiring that providers have to establish trust beforehand or do any kind of heavyweight in network coordination. And so just in terms of the players here, how do we see this working? We build on top of the MVNO idea. We call an MVNO a broker. I think, I believe this is actually terminology we borrowed from Magma. And the way we envision this working is that a user is going to sign up with a broker, just like they do with an MVNO today. But the one shift we're going to make relative to an MVNO architecture is that we're going to say that a broker or an MVNO is going to on demand be able to leverage any infrastructure operator, even though there's no trusted relationship with that MNO. So we're gonna ensure you can do things like billing and seamless mobility, but we're gonna enable that without requiring the broker to trust the cellular infrastructure operator. In order to do that, uh, just a very high level, what we end up doing is we refactor functionality that exists today in today's cellular architecture. So if we look at uh, today's MNO architecture, all the functionality, the data plane, the control plane, support for mobility and support for user management. So your HSS subscriber database, how you do accounting and billing, all of that is concentrated in the MNO. If we look at the MVNO architecture, it doesn't really, it doesn't really change the, um, what the, the network, the functionality we put in the network. Instead, the MVNO takes on some of the user management or the customer facing aspects of user management. What we do with Cellbricks though is quite uh, different. One, we take all aspects of user management, the subscriber database, accounting, billing, authentication, completely out of the network and located in the broker. And the other major change we take is we take support for mobility so roaming and handovers out of the network and into the user device. So as you can see, that's quite a refactoring, but also taking quite a bit of functionality out of the network. And I should mention, we don't change the RAN in any way. All of these changes are with changes to the cellular core. What are the potential benefits of this? You know, uh, initial motivation and what was driving us was to lower the barrier to entry for new operators. But in this process, what we also think you can enable is more efficient use of infrastructure because now you can sell up, set up cellular infrastructure and it's not just going to serve the subscribers of one MVNO or one service provider. It can service any user. And so we're, especially with the densification problems that 5G brings, we think this ability to make efficient use of infrastructure is important. And finally, just simpler infrastructure, because we've taken a lot of the heavyweight machinery 
uh, around mobility and around authentication and accounting out of the network. So how do we do all this? Um, the two main challenges, one is how do you do secure attachments and billing when you don't have mutual trust, when you're connecting to infrastructure that you cannot assume is trusted? And the second is how do we do this seamless mobility if we're not relying on in-network coordination? So just to very quickly give you a sense of what this looks like, the way in which, let me start with secure attachments and billing. The way this works is that when a user goes up to an MNO, the user is going to send a message that says something like, I'm user Bob, my broker is Google, Google Fi, and the MNO I'm trying to get access from is MNO3. The MNO is gonna forward that to the broker. The broker is gonna check it, and if it all looks good, it's going to authorize the MNO to say, okay, I am actually Bob's broker, and here is authorization for you to service Bob. And they can exchange cross parameters or billing parameters in the process. The way we make all of this secure is by leveraging public key encryption. So this is a bit of a shift from how cellular networks, cellular networks today do this with shared keys. We're instead gonna use it with public keys. But all the machinery we're using is exactly how any online transaction works, how any credit card transaction, or when you use AWS, or when you use any online service, we're reusing exactly the same authentication mechanism. And so what we can get now is three-way authentication between the broker, the MNO, and the user that is cryptographically secure and cryptographically verifiable. So you cannot have, for example, a broker come back later and say, I didn't authorize that transaction. The MNO actually has proof that the broker said, yes, please go and service my user. So this is just secure attachment having evidence and securing that you're serving a valid user that belongs to a particular broker and that the MNO was actually the one the user wanted to connect to. In order to do accounting, we have the MNO send its uh, usage statistics. So the foundation for billing is that we can accurately account for the resources used. And to do this, we have the MNO periodically tell the broker what, uh, send statistics of what resources the user used. And so the broker is expected to pay the MNO accordingly, but the broker needn't trust what the MNO told it. And so in addition, we have using hardware support on the UE, we have the UE send statistics about the resources oh. it believes it has used. And using these uh, statistics, both the broker and the MNO can build up a reputation system so that brokers can over time favor certain MNOs for, that have better quality or that have better billing terms or so on. So that, that was attachments and billing at a very high level. In terms of mobility, seamless mobility, just to dig a little bit deeper into what the problem is here. Today with handovers, we assume that the network is coordinating to make the user's mobility experience seamless. What they're really doing is ensuring that a U a user's IP address is staying unchanged. And if your IP address stays unchanged, then your TCP connections stay unchanged. And so your application sessions persist and are fine. We can't really assume this anymore in an ecosystem where we say we have lots of smaller providers, because every time you're switching administrative boundaries, you're gonna change IP addresses. And trying to preserve a, an IP address across administrative boundaries would be just way too hard. Here, what we do really is leverage the fact that actually solutions to this problem have emerged from industry already. There are a number of modern transport protocols like multipath TCP or Quick. that are now, these are ITF standards. These are in every operating system. They're available widely. And what these transport layer protocols do is they handle mobility at a layer above IP or layer three. And so now you can have a TCP connection or, or sorry, a transport layer connection that is fine even if your IP address is changing underneath you. And so we can have a user switch towers and be switching their IP address, but your higher layer connection and your application is just fine with that. So in some sense, we actually don't have to solve this problem because other people have solved it for us already. And so effectively what we're doing, this is moving mobility support out of layer three and out of the network and into the transport layer and layer four. And so with that, just a um, very quick recap of the architecture, we are taking, we're trying to lower the barrier to entry for smaller scale or mid-scale providers so that we can have an ecosystem with lots of providers. 
The way we want to do this is to allow a user to consume access on demand from any provider, including potentially untrusted providers. And the technical pieces to do this, it turns out are actually pretty simple. It's moving authentication and accounting out of the network by moving to a model that is very much what online services do today with public key based cryptography and relying on layer four support for mobility instead of layer three. With that, we're going to switch to talking about, we've prototyped the system and Jihong was going to talk a little bit about what we've built on top of Magma. So Jihong, yes. can I? Okay. Yes, hi, um, I'm Zihong. Today I'm going to talk about, uh, briefly talk about our prototype implementation to evaluate the end-to-end -end correctness of our cell brick design, as well as some preliminary evaluation results. So this diagram is the prototype. We, it mainly consists of three components. The first one is uh, USRP, and then USRP is essentially a software-defined. Uh, see the next one. <laughs> it's a software-defined. Uh, a software-defined radio devices that can provide that we use to provide radio connectivity between the UE and the ENOB. And because, as Silva mentioned, we require no changes to the RAN, so we don't need to modify anything on the USRP. And the second component we use is SRS LTE, which is an open source software stack that we use for our UE and ENOB. And know that because Cellbricks require no changes to, to our ENOB, so essentially we keep that part unmodified. And then, see the next one. And then the last one will be Magma, because the focus of today, we also leverage Magma in our prototypes. Specifically, we use Magma's access gateway and we extend it as the core network and then we extend it to support the three-way secure attachment that we just mentioned. And also we use Magma's orchestrator and we add a service called BrokerD, which is responsible for the uh, broker services uh, in the cell bricks. Uh, next slide, please. With, with our prototype, we are able to evaluate some key performance metrics. Specifically, we measure the end-to-end -end latency of our attachment protocol. And the goal here is to understand the relative performance of our secure attachment protocol compared with standard attachment. And in our test step up, we essentially have the UE, ENOB, and the XS gateway in the local machines. And then we vary the location, uh, we vary the location of the, our orchestrator, which consists of both the subscriber DB for standard attachment and the broker D for our secure attachment. And in this part, we have uh, we can essentially decompose the attachment latency for both schemes. And there are, I would not go into detail, there are many two takeaways. The first thing is that the actual processing, mainly the crypto operation, our secure attachment require add to only less than two milliseconds end-to-end -end latency. And secondly, uh, when it, uh, because cell bricks in our attachment protocol, we make sure there's only one RTT between the, uh, between the telco and the broker, while in standard attachment, there are two RTT. Therefore, as you can see on the right side of this plot, when we deploy the orchestrator on the, on the cloud, our attachment actually have less, much less le attachment latency because of one less RTT. Uh, next slide, please. And beyond just uh, evaluation on the test bed, we also try to perform emulation over, over internet. Specifically, what we do is that, uh, next bullet point is next. What we do is that we try to perform emulation over existing cellular and wireless networks. The, the goal here is that we want to understand the performance of real applications under real world conditions with a real world deployment. So we picked four representative applications iPerf, video streaming, web page loading, and voice over IP. And then what we do here without going into detail in high level is that first of all, we need to detect handover. We do so by logging and inspecting the baseband messages that the uh, modem receives. And once the handover is uh, detected, we need to emulate IP changes because as mentioned today, it's in, during handover, your IP changes, your IP usually stay unchanged. So we actually need to emulate IP changes and we, we do so with an injected latency. And this latency is to account for the extra latency due to the attachment. And the third step will be once the IP change, once the IP changes happen, MPTCP will react to it and maintain the connection. And know that MPTCP had a nice, nice feature that it basically had the same socket API towards the application. So basically we don't need to port any of the application logic. And next slide, please. And with this emulation, uh, we were able to show, and this table shows us uh, the key perform matrix for all four applications. Without going into detail, the conclusion here is that mo a host driven mobility in Cellbridge actually incurred a negligible performance com impact compared with the baseline. In, it's between, across four applications, it's between minus 1.6% to 3.1% compared with the baseline. 
This indicates that uh, our host-driven mobility methods in cell bricks not only allow, allow a more flexible and, and, and simpler network, you also have very competitive performance in terms of the performance user has received. So this indicates that host-driven mobility is actually a promising direction to explore further. Yeah, that's all. Yeah, so just let me very quickly in conclusion, you know, we started this as a research project thinking, let's just think about this clean slate. You know, this is what we want to enable, not worry about whether it's deployable or backward compatible. It turns out what we are finding is that actually the pieces we need to enable this are really um, pretty modest. It's pu embracing public key based authentication and doing three-way authentication, secure counters and device hardware, and really embracing or adopting MP new protocols like MPTCP and QUIC. All of these seem to be well within reach. And as Jihong just mentioned, we've been building a prototype and doing real world measurements. Um, this is something we continue to build on as well as extend it for features like privacy or differentiated quads and so on. And with that, uh, that was what we had, thank you. And I'm happy to take questions.